Cartman King. I <coughs> am known now by Mrs. King, and I'm heavy on the Mrs. I really didn't want to get that <laughs> But uh, in any event, I've been involved in the arts and heritage community here in the region for over 30 years. And um, for many years, they knew me as Arlene Arlene, the Festival Queen, for mm -hmm. coordinating major events here, including the World Emergency Championships, Hopeful Festival, um, uh, Hunter Children's Festival for its uh, history here in town. But now my focus more is on being an active full-time artist, whereas I'm doing a lot of visual arts and hoping that the visual arts um, illustrations that I'm working on that I can translate them to film and make some uh, short films with those that, uh, the little stories that are told, I think, can be quite fun in that media. But also I'm um, collaborating with a friend and we're looking at making a documentary of a significant uh, cultural icon um, here in Thunder Bay. And I don't want to say too much more just yet, but it's a big and exciting project <laughs> in celebrating the third anniversary of this icon. And then you just send me the link. Perfect. I have more um, for knowledge of on photography than on film, but I'd like to bring how to do documentaries and especially sound and uh, editing. I've uh, worked with Kelly a bit on different projects that she has, <laughs> so I've learned some things. And I have so many more. Hi, um, I'm April. I'm a First Nations band member. Um, never lived on reserve, but I have lived in four years in Thunder Bay. Um, I'm a famous internal student from the arts program at the Academy of Music and Teaching Studies at Harvard. So I'm a major artist in the story. But I've been taking a lot of the Aboriginal Studies courses, which kind of like I've always been interested in the making stuff like that. I never really like proactively or anything, but I was always a continuous learner. Um, I have a really diverse family. I just, just to my to my grandmother, so I kind of wanted to think of maybe being able to do something with them one day before the they are no longer here. So it's kind of really important. So I think being here is kind of my friend Shirley kind of let me know what was going on with this course. I'm like, I want to take that course. So here I am today, and also I'm a student um, working back at the university, and I'm in the IL department, and the department is to do, um, there's, there's an oral history collection, and it's not been uploaded yet into the website, so that's my job. So I'm hoping to learn maybe a little bit. I'm not sure if that's kind of what I can learn here, but I'm sure you guys can do some things. And that's basically it. I'm here. Thank you very much for having me. Hi, I'm Emily. Uh, I live in Toronto. Uh, my background is in journalism. I've been working um, in team TV journalism at the CBC uh, for a while now. But and, and the documentary is always something that's been there that I'm more interested in, so I've kind of made the decision to. <coughs> Pursue that, and, and uh, so I'm kind of just exploring and seeing where I could really see myself. Um, and then um, just working with Hot Ducks, um, the, the documentary film festival in Toronto. Uh, that's how I found out about this festival. So I'm um, in Toronto about this workshop, which is great. It's kind of first time I'm well, yeah, so. to be there. And, um, I'm not sure there's not one thing I'm kind of hoping to learn. So it's kind of just it's everything to learn a lot about. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> sorry, I just got to. I just want to. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, I'm gone. I'm, uh, I'm with the Basic Cultural Development Club coordinator, so I work with Kelly on the ass and a couple other people here who are involved with the best club. Um, so I'm here just mostly for kind of general knowledge of multimedia and learning a lot uh, from Riaz and Kelly as we go along and uh, for the festival. Uh, I'm not sure how much I'm going to be here, and that's something we can talk to 
out of the box. It's the best helper choosing all our films right now. So I have some work to do, so I don't know how long <laughs> I can actually be here, but I certainly, if I can kind of drop in and come a little bit, that was what I was hoping to do. And, and uh, I guess you know, great to see a good, uh, a good number of people here. Um, I was <laughs> So a filmmaker here in front of the photographers. Um, been around for a while. Just, uh, my philosophy is, you know, if you're not going to learn something today, why get up? So I'm just going to sponge and so on this whenever I'm hoping to learn it's morning. So I'm not going to miss this. Uh, my name is Chris Stone, I'm a local sculptor. Uh, it's always been a story in my side documenting artwork and sculpture. So I kind of want to do it so it's more active and it presents it more live than a stationary object that you trip over in the art gallery and go to it. I guess I'm Ron Herpel and um, I, uh, I work here and um, I'm not sure what I'm interested in. I'm interested in all of this, but I'm interested in seeing what happens. In terms of the chemistry here in Thunder Bay, Many people who are going to be in the same way that I would leave here and create things that you're going to do in the future. I'm Adrian. I'm Adrian. I'm Adrian. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. Whatever I want. My name is Gavin. I'm a multimedia artist. I work with images, uh, still images, photography, um, and um, video, uh, and also in the past few years I have started working with uh, interactive media, uh, using code in my artwork. So I'm interested in that. And I work as um, uh, in the Bay Street too. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, yeah, I would be happy to work with my Okay, so um, uh, we're uh, live streaming now, so um, I want to, let's see here, yeah, oh, oh yeah, right. okay, there we go, sorry, <coughs> anyways, here I am, hi Mary, hi Mary in Moussini, <laughs> hopefully she's been waiting patiently for us to log on, and um, I don't know if there's a way for her to. Um, she can chat. She can chat. We, she can chat with us. So once she's log, logged on, and then um, anyway, so well, just bear with us. We're getting ready to go. We have one other person. Oh yeah, Satinia too. I just sent her the link. Right. Yeah, and I just sent her the link also. So. How's the deal with getting this stream? It's recorded seconds. too, right? Yes. Yeah. But it's few seconds late, so <laughs> you might not be. Okay. And uh, so let me, Adrian, if you could just help me as to set that up, and then um, so um, I mean, do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Show stuff. So, yeah. Um, um, so the easiest way to show stuff is if you can just uh, bring it up here. Yeah. And you can plug into my plug that in there. So. Is it possible to get the internet? For the internet, yeah, I can help yeah, you log in. Okay. So. Um, okay. It's it's too late to 
to get this over because then we can just oh I need that again. Um, so the password, uh, the only way I know to do it is to log on with my LU. So I think, I think it doesn't matter how many. So go to uh, uh, anyone else who's trying to log on. Go to pick LU. Is it Lakehead U? It's Lakehead. Uh, um, not network. It's uh, Lakehead U. Just Lakehead U. And then okay. And then the username is KJ. Saxver, S A X V E R, okay, and then the password is capital S H E, no, just one capital, H E, it's Shiva Films, H E B A F I L M S 08. Now everyone knows my password. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just it's just a capital S, and the rest is lowercase. And yeah, that just lowercase for the for my university login. And if you're a university student here, you could use your own login. <laughs> or you can use the guest login. Oh, guest login. Okay, thanks. I didn't know that. Okay, here, here, give me the guest login then. It's on the floor there. Log there. Charging. Okay. Okay. Anyone else, if they're having trouble, there's a guest login here if you can't. Okay. Okay, here's the guest log. Okay. Okay. Does anyone else, anyone else need paper? Here, I'll give you the guest, I'll give you the slip of paper here. Because I don't know how many. So, I mean, it's going to be talking. But then, yeah, if you can use that. Does anyone have a pen to lend to Clarence? Yeah. And then, uh, um, so, because we're going to shoot the screen, too, when she's showing it. And then you can pan over to him when she's talking. No, no. Can I take this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can turn it around, yeah. Right. So then you can see what you're doing. Oh, right. I forgot. It doesn't work. Oh, okay. Am I blocking the view of the screen? No, no. Oh, just squeeze over. Oh, it's the way. It's a lot. Is that better for you? Okay, so as I mentioned before, I, um, I started my work uh, I think, about 20 years ago, a bit of a uh, and I was really interested in documenting. And really, it is there because, like, uh, as you may know, it's quite a um, conflicted, dramatic case. I was um, uh, producing and sometimes directing uh, documentaries that dealt uh, with what's happening. And um, I think I produced quite a lot. Um, if, you, if you're interested to know more about it, because you know, want to get into the system, you can always go to my website, which is amicusmedia.com. And when you look at project in film, so there's a list of my projects. Uh, so you can read and see, and I can give links to somebody who wants to see my film. Because to many of them, if you go to the film page, there's also an option to see some of the films. For example, let's say, uh, Sentence to Mary, about divorce. So you can see expert here, but you can also see the whole <coughs> film. I can just give you the password. Let's keep it for yourself. You can, you can see some of my films. Uh, so I did documentaries for many years. When I moved to Canada, I continued to produce films. One of them, for example, was uh, um, an interesting uh, film that I co-produced with French parties about uh, music in the Middle East, a journey about uh, musicians from Egypt and uh, Lebanon and Syria, you know, places like Aleppo. You know, 
life were more maybe pressed but in place back then. So there's some historical moments that no longer exist. Uh, that was my first documentary in Canada. And, you know, during the, the years, also things started to come to my mind that many things are changing, that, you know, documentaries are being made, but also a lot of the projects are becoming not regular linear documentary storytelling, but there's a way to tell a story that involves audiences and, and brings also an opportunity to a project that actually the audience creates with me. So uh, one of my interesting projects that I would like to mention to you is a project called Love Letters of the Future that was conceived at around 2009 and it was a campaign that was initiated by Greenpeace International and I just want to show you something about it. <laughs> I think I might have increased the volume a lot. Sorry? The volume. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, we prepare, it's always good when you have a project to have a kind of documentation. So the online projects, you know, after they're done, they disappear sometimes. So we tried to document part of it and just keep it as kind of uh, memory. is a global cross-media campaign produced and developed by Nanapa Media and sponsored by the Ontario Media Development Corporation, Greenpeace International, and a coalition of NGOs united on the critical issues of climate change. It began with the launch of a website. www.lovelessforthefuture.com is an open stage for the public to share messages of hope for the future so the leaders of today and the children of tomorrow will know we care about preserving our planet. International celebrities introduce new topics and encourage the public to get involved. The goal is to collect a critical mass of love letters and to present them during the UN Climate Conference in Copenhagen. The result was overwhelming. In only a few weeks, we collected thousands of letters from people in more than 128 countries Lovers to the Future became a moving collage of images, thoughts, and ideas linked to one global goal, the urgency of saving the world today from a predicted future of <coughs> climate catastrophe. The top 100 letters with the highest number of votes were selected to enter a specially constructed time capsule and to be preserved for the next 100 years. With the help of the Imaging and Media Lab at the University of Dublin, we used a modeling technology and encoded the data on film so the letters can be played back or viewed on any device in 100 years from today. As more and more visitors submitted letters to the site, a surprising and unforeseen element appeared. Scattered all over the site were mysterious letters marked with a red Japanese symbol and signed by a young woman named Maya from the year 2109. Maya's letters were in fact the key to have a video transmission that was sent from the future. Each of the letters contained a crystal clue hidden in video, audio, or text rhythm. As players cracked the clues and entered according to the photo, they managed to reveal the mysterious fragments of my story. We are in the middle of an ongoing Holocene extinction. That's a man-made extinction. And it is exposing a hundred times faster than ever before. That's my grandmother. By the time she turned 10 in 2031, over 20% of all species on the planet were already extinct. 
in a hundred years, half of all species are gone. And they'll never come back. And it happened so fast. So try to win. Unlocking the final transmission challenged the players to participate in a real-life collaborating experience. Blues were distributed in 13 cities, Amsterdam, Hong Kong, Toronto, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Mumbai, and many more. By calling a local number, players heard a looping voice message from Maya that revealed the missing piece in the puzzle. And only a hundred years for waiting in the future. One hundred years, it's not very long. My grandparents are there with Forums, green blogs, and traditional media followed and documented the
really showing a lot of interesting projects. Some of them are more interesting than the project I mentioned today. And, um, and you can just experience different projects. I think it's the best way to be inspired and to learn. So that's a great source, and you know, it's Canadian. And another international one that I also want to mention to you called Doc Lab. And this is, uh, you know, the festival of documentaries in Amsterdam, which is one of the best and biggest in the world, actually the first documentary festival ever. They were very early in the game of the interactive and they have a very good curator and they, they call it Doc Lab. And if you go to this website, it's part of the ITFA festival, they have fantastic examples of really interesting projects and they have an annual you know, meetup at the festival. So I just wanted to inspire you to have a look and be inspired and we can talk more later. I also worked on uh, virtual um, uh, reality, you know, you can see some assets. So I didn't want to take too much time and to show you other projects, but if you're interested, I can talk either with different people or later in your time and show you some of those experiments as well. And you can use this. And um, in terms of just the trajectory of, of my kind of practice, and this is a piece, I think I mentioned I was doing visual art mainly, although I was using film and video and installations. That was during the 80s. And I was based in Toronto during that time, and then I moved to uh, Harare in Zimbabwe and lived there for five years and worked quite a lot all through Southern Africa. And while I was there, it was like such a huge re-education for me. It was like such a privilege to have that opportunity to um, look in it from a completely different perspective on the place, on myself and the place I was from, and to understand how it fits within a history of colonialism, of global colonialism. And so this was one piece where I was looking at the connections between things that I hadn't been able to see before. And I just want to, I'm just going to show you a couple of these things just to show that. I think for, for all filmmakers and artists, you work with whatever you've got at hand, right? And you make something out of it. And you can't wait around for the ideal thing or whatever. And so here I was using fabrics that, that are sold in Zimbabwe that people wear all the time. And then I was doing a lot of photography and developing it myself. I was, I was um, actually printing it onto rocks that I would use in installations and stuff to, to really look at this place where I was standing. And this piece is called, this is a photo of, of a woman uh, working with um, uh, mending something. And the piece is called, The Risk-Taking Banker Needs the Conscientious Seamstress to Hold His World Together. Mm -hmm. And it was the title of an essay that had really inspired me and in helping me to see how things are connected. So um, mm -hmm. that was one thing that set me off on another path. This was another piece I did at the same time, around the same time in Zimbabwe, and it's called Structural Adjustments. I guess we can't see it in a good background because I got too much stuff going on here. Uh, put, it on. put in the viewer. It's, well, okay. And this again was a piece that was done on a, the, on a blanket, 
and um, this piece was done in 1990, I think, and it was at a time when, again, everyone was in the development community and international community, we're talking about structural adjustment as something that should be imposed on other countries, not realizing that it was <coughs> actually happening in Canada as well. Um, but these, this was done on a blanket that's given out by aid agencies in Zimbabwe, right? <laughs> And again, it's fabric that, that people make their clothes out of. And um, the text, it was like a poetic text. This is like an actual um, leather belt. And it was because all, all of the um, rhetoric in the press and everything was about how everybody has to tighten their belts because of austerity. So this is this woman, she's tightening her belt. She's taking on more and more people to look after because that's what happens with structural adjustment programs and austerity. It falls on often women to look after more people. Um, and then the text is just about her internal experience of what that feels like to, to be experiencing that rather than some abstraction. Um, and there was one more. I was going to show you the. Yes. This is rearranged thing. So I'll just go on from there. Um, because I really wanted to talk about another project, and it's kind of big and complicated, so I'll just try and start. The, maybe I'll show you a trailer first. So I'm skipping ahead. I can't, oh no, I'll give you a little, little story. I, I came back from uh, Zimbabwe, moved back to Canada, ended up doing a master's in visual art at York University. I decided I didn't want to do this community. I've been doing a lot of community video in Africa, where I, again, lived with, with, with communities and worked collaboratively. And so I did a master's and then I, I, I um, ended up working with communities here. I did a very lengthy project in the Northwest Territories with Decho First Nations. Um, and I had, I had um, the way I started designing, doing that kind of work, uh, community work, is I always uh, have a training component. I always train the people that are in the projects that I'm working with. And um, so at the end, I usually actually make sure that equipment is bought so that when I leave, then people can keep on making their projects. So um, I had done some of those projects and then um, ended up, I was kind of uh, just finishing up that project, which ended up being three years, and it uh, ended up with a film called Fighting for Our Land. It was around land negotiations, <laughs> um, and it's available online. I could show you maybe just the intro while we're talking. <coughs> It ended up being a one-hour documentary that was all made by the people in the Dead Show and me. So it was a co-production. Let's say I'm not going. But I'm not that much now. Hmm. Yeah. Why is there no sound? Yeah, there's sound. Is there? Oh, it's yeah. coming out? Oh, yeah. It's coming out of your, you have to <laughs> set the <work. laughs> Your this computer. Is HDMI, should be, uh, yeah. you have to, but you have to tell your computer to. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. No. Oh yeah, that'll work. It goes out the. Uh, yeah. Phone. Yeah. Otherwise, you do that. Yeah. Okay. Or you just tell your computer to take the sound out of the HDMI. In the sound. I think we better do that. Yeah. Can't. Go. Just, just go to the. Right, check the sound. <coughs> Too much sound, I think. <coughs> We're fighting for the right to keep our culture and to keep our land. It's mine, according to what my elders tell me. I never give up my rights, I never give up my life. The rights that I think were given bribed, like, like with the Mackenzie oil and gas. 
we're uh, facing the question here in the north, shall history repeat itself? Okay, I'm just going to stop it there. I just wanted to give you an idea. It's available on, online on the, the Dutch First Nations website. Um, so I was finishing that project, um, and um, which was, again, an incredible learning experience. And um, and I, I, one thing, I think the focus on my work I was uh, shifted during that, and very much in terms of the, the project was for the Decho First Nations. They were the primary audience, and all the way through the making of that work, I had to prioritize that audience. And I had to say, if nobody else gets this work, that's their problem, because this work has to be for the Decho First Nations first, because it was telling their history. And it was a, a privilege, but also a terrifying challenge to do that for me. So, um, so I was just finishing that, and I live in Toronto downtown. And I was my neighbor. I, in Toronto, you can live for years beside people and not know who they are or what they do or anything. And this guy started knocking on my door, and he had moved up from Detroit some years before. And I didn't. I sort of see him at demonstrations now and then. Didn't really know. Him. Anyway, it turned out he was working in a place where. Uh, homeless people drop in, the drop in center in a church. And um, he had been documenting cases of police abuse of the people he worked with, the folks he worked with <coughs> in this drop in center uh, for a number of years. And so he had realized I was a filmmaker. So he started knocking at my door any time of the day or night, can you come with your camera? And I would, the first time I went, it was a guy who had been beaten so badly he ended up dying two days later. And um, my friend, uh, pursued this in many ways, and he documented it, and we, we made, I made the video, and he does a lot of activism. He uh, went to the newspapers, he did an online campaign, um, and organized a demonstration, and the video was all part of that. We had a demonstration, during the demonstration, a guy came up, his face was completely, really, really um, handsome young guy, face completely full of wounds, he said, I'm here because I heard about this and like I need to be with you. And so I, I, I interviewed him. So this went on for a year. And this was before there was really there was really no discussion in the media at that time. This was about 2011 about police violence. No, nobody believed what was going on. And so um, one of them was Michael Allegon, this young guy. He's like got out of the hospital. He's in a hospital gown in February with no shoes on, surrounded by 12 police and shot within three minutes of arriving. So I was witnessing all of this that I didn't, hadn't known was going on. So we had all, of, and, and it was always the same. I would, I would edit them and put them online, and then Doug would organize the media and the activists around <coughs> them. So it was like a, a kind of campaign approach. And so after a year of that, we, we decided to make a, a longer, like a feature film about the whole, that whole time of that community and what had happened to them. So that's what we did. And, um, and I did it the same way with, as a, like me working with the community and they made a lot of decisions. Most of all, all of our decisions had to be consensual, consensus decisions. And um, I'm just gonna show you the trailer of that film and then talk to you a little bit more about one of the people in it after that. Because uh, a, a couple of projects came out of this project after it was finished, so I, I'll, I'll just go to that after. So here's the 
trailer. that film and started showing it, the community didn't want it shown for the first year without them being there, which really, really changed uh, the experience of getting the film out because we ended up taking people from the community to all the different venues that normally wouldn't welcome anybody like that. And so it really changed the dynamic of the screenings and the discussions afterward. Um, and now it's available online. Again, if you want to watch it, it's at whatworlddoyoulivein.com. Um, but one, one section of that film, Doug had uh, documented 36 cases of abuse, and he'd gotten a lot of uh, footage from the police. And one of the, the really incredible ones was about this guy named Gabe Jacobs, and he was in a wheelchair. And during the night of the G20, the police picked him up, and he didn't even know what the G20 was. But they charged him with, with trying to um, uh, slash a tire in a police van or something and threw him in a detention cage. So the cages, I don't know if you know about the G20 in Toronto, there were cages um, that actually were in a film studio that the police rented. They threw over a thousand people in those cages. They were actual cages. They looked like animal cages. Um, so Doug had petitioned, it took him two years to get the footage of, of the time that Gabe was in those cages. It was 30 hours, and um, he got it through a Freedom of Information thing. He gave me the footage, and I started working with it, and um, it, was, it was incredibly sobering to watch this. It was like the modality of evil. It was just like minute after minute after hour of this, and usually views from above of this guy in, in a cage <laughs> and with other people in the cage. Anyway, um, so I was, I was really um, upset about this and thought we need to do something more. So I started, I'm always starting collectives. Riaz knows this, he's in a collective with me too. Um, but I started a collective to do a project with the footage of Gabe in the Cages. And we just, I decided I wanted it uh, projected onto City Hall because they had made the decisions around the G20. And so we did some tests with that, the collective. And then we decided to do it um, during Nuit Blanche, because we wanted a really big audience, right? And they didn't want that. We, we came to them too late. So we just, we just did it guerrilla style. We went running around with our projector and our 
our audio stuff, and yeah. yeah can you just uh, give a uh, explain what Nuit Blanche? Is? Oh, Nuit Blanche is this huge uh, arts spectacle that happens every year uh, now in Toronto at the end of September, and it's and all it goes from <coughs> seven at night till seven in the morning. There's over a million people that come, and. It's been going for a few years, and over the years, the focus of the work has gone from kind of serious art to mainly kind of spectacle, right? It's very about entertain, art and as entertainment and spectacle. And so we wanted to kind of go in and, and um, show something else about this place, because what mm -hmm. had happened is that the, some of the footage we had was about the kettling at Queen of Spadina, where the police kettled all these people quite illegally. Um, so we, we projected footage of the kettling and of Gabe on that location, and people, in order to get to see their art project, had to walk past the footage of Gabe and the kettling happening. And we did the same at the spot where Gabe had been arrested, and we did four di and at City Hall, we did four different locations. We got chased out. Very interesting arguments about the the legality or illegality of projecting on a building, whether that is. Like it's, you're not really trespassing, it's immaterial, but is it trespassing? Like, anyway, that's a side thing. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so we did that project and it was incredibly satisfying, especially for Gabe, he came in his wheelchair and we didn't know, but he died the following spring. So, and it was just meant so much for him to see that. And he also won his human rights case. So all of that was good. And so then I'm gonna tell you one little other side story um, related to Actually, I guess I could show you, I'll just show you a few images from what I was just talking about. I don't think I have time to show you the video, but there's video as well. Um, these are too small. Hmm. Anyway, if you want to, there's a video online um, called Cages Test One, Test One Cages which you can watch. Um, we can I post can all these links yeah, I'll just later on okay. the Dogs North Facebook and then on the website okay. so that people can find them. Yeah, that's better. Find them. Um, I'm just having trouble because everything is so small mm -hmm. on my screen now. Um, so I was just going to uh, show you just uh, the intro of What World Do You Live In? Because I want to go back. I, actually, I won't show you the whole thing. This Veronique is talking about, and the way it worked was that, um, and I'll talk about this process a lot more later, but as a filmmaker, I had to work with a whole lot of people who also had a whole lot of people working with them in this situation, because we were all not safe doing this project, because the police did not appreciate this project. I'm not sure why. Um, and so all of the people in the project um, had people working with them to keep them safe and to keep them from being triggered and stuff. Um, and then I was intercutting all of the shots in this film. This is a kind of a stylistic thing. Between every every interview, there is always a um, shot of the city, of, of the place oh, where the child is. So, so this is Veronique, who's almost like the star of the film. Um, so between each, you get a cutaway, it's called, to, to a location. And, and it, it, nothing particular going on, just here we are kind of feeling. And then we go to the next thing. And so um, this, I'm just going to show you this guy. His, he was one of the people who had issues. Uh, early January, I was heading to Sanctuary to do a dance. I go strolling through with my pass, doing the turnstile, and don't I jam up my private parts into their bar and scream because I'm a loud guy. I, I say out loud, F, can anything else go wrong? And two sleep cops who are very young that work for TTC but are signed under the Metro Police because they were Metro Police badges. The nice guy said, come there as I'm strolling to go down to the south northbound and my attitude was, what, bud? And we chat. And he said I was under arrest. So he stanced and said, what are you talking about? Well, now you're under arrest for being drunk. I said, what? 
four effing beers in my system. I'm dressed in a fedora, a gray suit, and a jacket. He runs my name. Next thing you know, a van pulls up with the ETF. Two sergeants from 51 have a history. It's not that big of a history, but I got warning stars. Now I'm really aggressive. I asked to sit on the floor, because now he's saying he's going to charge me for assault, because I stepped on his foot. I'm also being top notch. Buddy, you're fucking with a mental case right now. And I was. I went into Mike McEwen street mode. Sat on the floor, sat there for 40 minutes with a voice like mine, believe me, I drew a crowd. Because I have rights, I thought. Really, I had none. Before the room became available, the little room where they write you up, where, they, where nobody can see things. He said to his sergeant, he said, is there no mental act I can get the guy on with a history like his? So he still got his rubber ducks on, which I found amusing. Six foot four, 240 pound idiot in my books. And we went into the room. Everybody else left. And I said to him, I think you're very inadequate in your job, and you're probably inadequate penis size because you're a real asshole. I don't get what I'm even here standing through this turmoil for. His partner said, shut up. I got one of those on the chest. I smiled and said, see, you're the type of guy that knock out homeless people. I said, with my history, I'm going to do nothing. They need courses, for one, for guys who have anxiety disorders like me. that clip because I'm just going to tell you about um, another project that I just finished. And this is just to talk about how when you work with, <coughs> with and in communities, you end up, um, you end up uh, having very um, long-term, building long-term relationships with people. And so uh, Mike is an incredible um, force in his community. And he was diagnosed with liver cancer about six months after we finished this film. And so he, um, he had come to me after seeing the film, he was so excited about these cutaways of the city, because as soon as he got a cell phone eight years ago, he spent all, he's, he's shot over 400,000 uh, photos uh, what, just walking around. He's lived on, the on and off the street most of his life in the same area, just documenting his life and the life of the street and the, the the city, the condos, he documented a condo being built outside his building, uh, 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 like one frame a day and things like that. So we shared that we would talk all the time about like our, our um, love of, of photography, really. Um, and so when he was diagnosed, um, I said, um, would you like, a, like to make a film and walk around the city and you talk about growing up here and what's different? Because he's like, he's, he's like an expert. The whole area's been gentrified. It's condos everywhere now. Everything's been torn down. He grew up with. He said, "No, I can't. Can't. Can't do that. I want to. I want to leave a book for my friends and my family, of all my photos. So that's what we did. We just finished the book, and it's um, all of his. It's a lot of his photos. We we selected ones, and then I sat with him and just talked about the photos, and then I transcribed them and we put them in as text with the images. And um, right now he's just gone into. Um, he's in palliative care in in St. Mike's and. If you don't mind, I'll tell him we were talking about him today. He would love that. Um, but for me, it, it's been quite difficult because emotionally it's difficult. But also, um, Facebook has been a big deal. He was in in uh, in um, Hep C, um, having met, uh, treatments, and a lot of his friends from there haven't been able to go out of the house for a couple of years, and they've been living vicariously through Mike's photos that he posts on Facebook, and that's their experience of the world, really. And so um, Facebook is a really big, has been a vehicle for him and a way of, of, of uh, socially kind of really having a, a very wonderful life, actually, in many ways, even though there are things that he struggles with. Um, and so for me, though, it's difficult because I think he, he wants to die on Facebook. And he's posting things that I find difficult to look at. And he would like me to film him dying, and I don't want to do that. So. 
I've kind of been pushed against a wall in terms of how you how to sort out those kinds of relationships. So I just want to leave you with that. And there's many other things about this project. I have a feeling it's never going to leave me. I'll be working on it probably. It keeps that uh, new 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 parts of it keep popping up. But um, thanks for listening. Better give you some time. <laughs> Can I just say that, Kelly, yes. you're in charge. The coffee has arrived. Yeah. But we can. At 10.45. Yeah. Okay. Just so you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 15, 15 minutes and then we'll break for coffee. There's a question. There's a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, what's Mike's? Can I put my mic space? I'll, I'll put my here. Yeah. Yeah. Right with you and it's spelled the MC. Do you want to be coffee? No, no, no. Let's stick to schedule. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just need my website and access to open it. Okay. <laughs> no, I'll just do mine more quickly. Okay. I can give you the book. You can just go on there. Yeah, well, um, while he's getting organized, um, so we'll have our coffee break at 10:45. So we'll have, you know, 10 minutes or so for Edie to just present a little bit, and then um, we'll have our coffee break. And when we're having coffee, talk to someone you don't know, <laughs> and uh, um, and maybe just share some of the ideas. Something that if you have an idea of something that you might like to do when you're doing the doing our, we'll break up into groups. Um, so Wednesday and Thursday, we'll be actually planning a production and, and making something. Um, so you can just pitch your ideas, talk to people, and, and, uh, and then um, just uh, we'll, we'll form groups. So pitch your idea, what you're interested in, what you'd like to do over the next few days, and, uh, and, and then you can when we, whenever we have breaks and lunch and everything, you can just sort of carry on. And then we'll be presenting them, and then our mentors um, will be able to give some feedback and some suggestions. Okay, so I'll just talk briefly about my work. Um, I pulled up the, this is my personal website, and you can look at things in more detail. Um, I started as a photographer. Um, I have a portrait gallery, which I won't go into, but it goes all the way back to my earliest work, which is in the National Gallery of Canada collection, and their portraits, their analog black and white portraits, um, sort of documentary style. And then I worked in the music industry for quite a long time with, um, a lot of my portraits are working with other artists, writers, poets, um, musicians. Um, so I'd had a bit of a commercial career doing, um, particularly in the punk rock era, which was my favorite music era, um, do it working with a lot of the artists in that, in that time. Um, and sort of just around that time or shortly after, I got involved with a collective called The Funnel, which was experimental filmmakers, and we had a gallery as well as a theater space. Um, so I ended up doing a bit of music myself as well and during that time and performance, usually with film projections. Um, and um, currently, I've been working, maybe I'll just quickly show you, um, I started working, uh, moving away from portraiture and um, doing more kind of these environmental projects that, um, um, I find it hard to find the bar, oh there it is, um, these gr large installations of um, grid works of um, this one. Um, I started that when I, I, I spent some time in Australia in 1988 and 89, um, and I got very inspired by d landscape details. It was almost like I started discovering that landscape has a voice, and I wanted to sort of go more deeply into that. Um, and these are just these were exhibited um, in um, you know various galleries in um, Toronto. Uh, this one here is called Great Lakes, 
And um, actually, um, the it was in a show called Great Lakes with a at, at Harborfront Center in Toronto, which was kind of um, a visual artist as well as poets doing readings and. Um, I um, had this as a grid, and the, and the grid is now owned by um, um, a lawyer called uh, Murray Klippenstein, who is an activist lawyer. He works for, on behalf, he was the Dudley George family lawyer, and he did all that work pro bono. And um, he you know, wanted this for his, for his office, so I'm very honored that it's in this kind of permanent place. Um, and yeah, some of it is unfinished work, and I'll sort of move on to the, to the films, but um, actually, if I maybe go back, oops, sorry, um, it's not my computer, so I might be a little sloppy. Um, in the um, environments page, um, I have a pinhole. I've been working with pinhole images because after working in digital, um, I kind of wanted to go back to a more analog process. And a friend of mine built me a pinhole camera that's you know one of these old ones with the bellows, but we took all that off and just put a pinhole. And um, so some of these, maybe I'll just show you the difference. Um, this is an analog um, pinhole image. Oh, there we go. Um, which has a much longer exposure. So it, the, the time frame of the image recording um, is slower, so you get a lot more, like in that 20 to 30 seconds of time, um, there's a life that unfolds. Uh, you know, the, especially um, I've, I've been sort of working more with environmental images, nature. So this one, you can see there's a different <coughs> kind of movement. Um, and there should be a arrow, oh here. So I, I'll just quickly, uh, that's also analog. Um, and then I started w working with digital pinholes, and I ordered a, you can, there's a place called Pinhole Resource. If you're interested, I'm now actually shooting video pinhole too, because I kind of like the poetic and romantic nature of that, that it's a little bit abstract. And this is actually, uh, this lake is, I grew up in Manitowoc, Ontario, um, which is sort of a place I still kind of consider homeland, and the film clip I'll show you, my most recent film is about the North Shore. Um, so I started working with these digital images in pinhole. At first I didn't like them because I found them very flat because the exposures are a lot shorter and so you don't get the same sort of experience of time as you do in the analog. But I've since learned how to like them by, you know, selective subject matter. Um, anyways, I will um, kind of leave that page. So that's just a little bit, yeah, of some of the photography. Um, and then I've got some films here. Um, this film here, uh, Conversations on the Lake, is about Lake Superior. Um, and um, I do have a, a trailer for it. Um, but I'll just talk about it a little bit. It says it's a film about land, water, and community on the Lake Superior North Shore. And so I focus on these different Canadian communities. And it started um, in about um, 2000 and sort of eight, I believe, where um, I got interested. I read about that they were going to put in this this um, trap rock or aggregate quarry on Mission Cotton Bay at Wawa, and the community was really divided about it. And I was really interested. I thought, wow, Wawa, that's like a two-hour drive from Manitowoc, where I grew up. And I, my mother still lived there, so I kept coming up to the north, and I've always still had a bit of a, a home life up here, despite the fact that I live in Toronto. And um, so I was interested in the fact that, you know, like when I was in high school, we played against Wawa. And, 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 and interestingly, the, the final kind of editor on the film, I did a lot of my own editing over time, and then I hired an external editor to help me kind of just polish the story and so I could kind of have another pair of eyes, and his name is Boyd Boninsky, and he grew up in Wawa. So it was kind of a full circle. But um, I went um, to, to Wawa first, and I interviewed um, Evelyn Stone, who's a former chief of uh, Mishpacatan uh, First Nation, and uh, as well as some other Wawa people. Um, 
people, um, uh, citizens concerned for Mission Cotton Bay, um, <coughs> and um, Lake Superior um, Watershed Council, I interviewed someone from there. So I went up a number of times, but as that story it unfolded, it, it started to expand, and I realized there's a lot of other issues, and people would tell me about, you should talk to so-and-so. So the whole project built kind of organically. Um, it was also entirely self-funded. Um, I didn't have any sort of production money, so I kind of built it slowly. I did all my own camera and most of my own editing um, until the very end when I had to kind of bring just a little bit of finessing into it. Um, and maybe we should just look at the trailer that on Vimeo. And is there audio? Should be. Um, I'm not getting it. Oh, <coughs> probably I didn't. I better pause. I have to do the same thing with my computer. And start again. Take the audio out of the HDMI. You're clicking the wrong arrow. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, I'll just play the trailer. You know, we have a value for a dead tree, but we don't have a value for a live one. We do die. is a very, very beautiful place. It's so sacred to us. And to be able to share that and that knowledge and that little bit of wisdom that we have today with the people out there. When we do have gatherings, I do invite people to come in and, and come and share with us the understanding of, of what the water means, of what the tree means, that birch tree, you know, those cedar trees. All of that medicine, that cedar that's on that tree, the medicine we have on the ground, you know, the, the plants, the flowers, the berries, all of that is medicine for us. And that's so important to, to conserve all of that. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization, which is a industry-funded organization to promote the, uh, the idea of storing nuclear waste uh, underground has been snooping around Canada looking for communities that might be interested. Lake Superior, which is right on our doorstep, contains 10% of the fresh water supply of the world. I think, and I think many others think too as well, that this is just too much of a risk to contemplate storing nuclear waste here on the North Shore of Lake Superior. Some people, I may say, they take rocks off the faces of certain paintings out there, and they take uh, relics, they look for relics, you know? And some of the people got to be educated, you can't do that, because you are digging up history. History is for everyone, and not just for you put it in your shelf or put it in your garden. Why do people do that? Things happen because people don't have the stories of their places in their hearts and minds. And so I think tourism begins at home, where we have our own stories to tell and our own pride in our natural heritage and our landscape. And then we can begin to see ways to provide an economic base for our people and our children. <laughs> Um, 
So the film explores um, the importance of story and the importance of our own story and um, also a um, sense of place, um, how we're anchored in these places. And, and so the project became kind of a values mapping. And the song that you heard in the beginning, Trees, is by Bonnie Cucci. She, she provided um, two songs. She's also a musician. I think some of you may know her because she does folk festivals up here. Um, so I can talk more about story and storytelling. I've taught screenwriting um, different kinds and I've worked, as I said, in different genres and maybe I'll just show you um, uh, a little bit of something um, earlier and, and very different. Uh, this is a film I made called Felicity's View, which did get funding from the Ontario Arts Council. And um, uh, in this film, I, I had t uh, my first drama, I had way too many locations and way too many characters. And it was, I ran out of money and it was really tough and it took a long time to finish it and I, I didn't have enough money to even do the project in the first place. So then I decided with my next screenplay, I would only have two characters and a, you know, two basically locations. So the whole story takes place, um, this woman is isolated in her apartment and this fellow, he's alone, um, he comes to the park and they notice each other and they start to connect. And it's also a film about aging. Um, this actress, Elizabeth Shepard, she's very well known. She lives in New York now. She's done all kinds of theater. She's from the UK. She's done the West End. She's done Broadway. She's done a lot in Toronto. And she was so happy to do it. I didn't think I could get her because it was an older woman in a romantic role. And we know um, about sexism in cinema and um, you know that older actors, uh, women in particular, don't get parts, mm -hmm. don't get a, particularly a starring role in a romantic. So I built a kind of romantic story about this, these older people who still have desire, and I wanted to uh, bring them together. So anyways, we'll just uh, have a little look at, because it's a different, and I had a cinematographer. It was shot on 16 millimeter film. Um, I had, yeah, more of a crew for this, and um, yeah, we'll just have a little look at it. to do with these feelings, but then she finally will confront him. And this is the building I live in, so we use, we use an apartment in the building. The ravenous ghosts are calling. That's what happens when you let their old spirits come back to haunt you, they start to hang around. So anyways, that's sort of, and, and I stopped making 
these kind of films because I could. I just found it took um, way more budget, um, and if you didn't get the funding, it was very hard to do drama because um, I had to pay the actors. She was um, a union actor. We had a pair of young movie makers who. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> um, it's nothing to do with me. Um, so yeah, so I um, I kind of now come back to my roots a little bit and interested in, in experimental film as a kind of visual anthropology, and um, I'm working on some projects that um, are again very sort of grassroots, small, um, and kind of self-directed re research-based project. But I know we've gone over, so. But yeah, uh, let's have a coffee and then let's have a coffee and we can talk some more and I can tell you way more, you know, as we go through these days. So. Okay, so I think our coffee is set up in the room next door over here. So. Um, and if you have coffee cups with you that you want to reuse, that would be good. Instead of going through a series of them over the next four days. And just so everybody knows, lunch is provided with this workshop, and um, we're all going to be um, walking up to my house, which is just two blocks up at noon. So we have lunch already. So, so there's no escaping this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> but we're providing good food. I don't know how to turn that off. Oh. Oh. Um, and maybe you can uh, just tell, uh, chat with our... our uh, Mary and uh, Selena, that we're going for coffee and we'll be back. Really? Oh, yeah. When are we going to be back? Uh, I think it's 10 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's um